You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 94 of the Common Descent Podcast. What's on the docket today? Well, last episode, we discussed cats, right? That's right. And as we mentioned in that episode, today's episode is dogs. It's a themed month. Yes, it is. So today we are going to explore dogs. Quote, unquote, man's best friend. Human's <laughs> best friend is... I, I suppose. Better way to say it. And all of their best friends. And their best friends. Canids. The canids. So dogs are more than just the pets we have. They include all of the wild varieties of canids canid right. wolves foxes jackals coyotes and everything in between and all those others so these are a very successful group they're all over the world they have a rich 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 history sure do so we will look through what makes a dog you know what makes them unique what do they consist of today and then how did they get to be the way they are both evolutionarily and how did they become the most characteristic domesticated animal <laughs> the pet the pet <laughs> and just like last episode following in the theme we'll make some comparisons between dogs and cats here yes. and there because it's just such a fun way to explore the two groups they just they compare so well now we are doing this episode not only because we did cats last time but also because it was requested by who we have gotten this topic requested by our patrons lydia samuel john and stephanie and our listeners jason robin and jonathan Thanks to all of you. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, cool, we we looked on the list not too long ago, and cats and dogs both had a whole bunch of requests. Yep. So that's where the idea for doing them back to back came from. Yes. So thank you for the request. This has been a lot of fun to do this themed month. Now, before we get into the topic, some quick announcements. We do have a Patreon, and on that Patreon, when you sign up at a certain level, we like to shout your name out here on the podcast. So thanks and welcome to. Richard, Will, and Alexander, and Zabby, who we missed oh, a yes, couple yes. episodes back. So <laughs> we missed Zabby. Apologies and welcome. An extra welcome to Zabby. And <laughs> apologies for missing. <laughs> but welcome to everyone. Thank you for your patronage. Yes, our Patreon supports the podcast. It allows us to keep it running, like, top to bottom. But it also has allowed us to do a lot of cool extra stuff and to upgrade our, our working conditions. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You make what we do so much easier. And we've got some other things cooking in the works that might come up in the not too distant future yes. that have, will also be supported uh, largely by Patreon. Speaking of recent things, we recently guest starred, guested on the ask a scientist podcast. That's right. We were approached by Victoria Crystal, mm -hmm. a fellow paleontologist, geoscientist who has a podcast, ask a scientist where the whole shtick is that kids send in questions to ask the scientist guests that episode. So we spent like an hour answering awesome questions from kids. And oh my goodness, it was so much fun. So we'll, we've posted it on our social media. We'll put the link to uh, their website in our episode description. And we'll post it again uh, in the not too distant future. Check it out. It's a really cool podcast. And speaking of not too distant future... Coming up is Dragon Con. First weekend in September. Yep. But it is virtual this year. Yep. For obvious reasons. For all the reasons. Yep. But we will be participating in it. We uh, sure will. In at least two things. At least two. Our, the current plan is that we will be part of a live chat you know, during the week where we will be live with other paleontologists to do paleo chat paleo q and a yep this is the virtual version of the paleo panel that we've been doing yes for the last couple of years and then the other one will be a panel of our own design a pre-recorded presentation that we will have put together for dragon con about how creatures are turned into monsters by hollywood nonsense this is if you've listened to our silver screen science series our episodes about movies You've heard us talk about monsterification, how Hollywood takes otherwise normal animals and tweaks them to make them movie monsters. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll, we'll keep people updated as it happens. Absolutely. That, this is all still 
you know, it hasn't happened yet, so things could change. Yep. <laughs> Chaos is the name of the game these days. This will all be happening around the time episode 95 comes out. Yes. So we'll also have... Uh, well, we won't have updates on episode 95 because <laughs> it won't have happened yet when we record it. But keep your eyes on social media. Uh, we'll be mentioning what happens. And that should be all of our announcements, which means we can move on to the news. Every episode, we like to gather up some of the recent paleontology fossil evolution news to keep us up to date and keep you all up to date. And to start us off, David, do you have news? You know, every now and then I'll see a news, I'll read a news bit and I'll think, this is cool. I'm excited to talk about it. Will's going to like this. <laughs> My first bit of news is about Hell Ants. I saw that title, and <laughs> it's a good title. <laughs> this is research by Philip Barden et al. in the journal Current Biology. And in the blog post, we'll link to a press release on phys.org via the New Jersey Institute of Technology. There is a group of ants that lived in the Cretaceous that are not alive anymore today that are the Hadomyrmacene ants. They are nicknamed, they are AKA'd as hell ants, which I assume is what the name means. Myrmacene oh. is ants. Hado is probably Hades. Yeah, that makes sense. Hell ants. These are ants. They were eusocial, according to the paper. The best kind of ants. And what they're known for, and part of why they have their name, is that they have these super weird faces. So if you think about ants today... On their faces, ants tend to have two main functional things. They have antennae on top for sensing, and then they have their jaws, which open and close like you imagine insect jaws opening and closing. The mandibles. The mandibles. Hell ants, A, have antennae. They also have horns, like these protrusions, typically up between the antennae. Hmm. Like, a single protrusion, usually, uh, based on the pictures that they've shown here, that are, some of them are, like, a triceratops horn in the middle. Others are long and thin. So, at least one species had a paddle-shaped <laughs> horn. <laughs> Why? The One of the ones with paddle shapes is thought to have possibly been reinforced with metal. Like, some insects today will reinforce part of their exoskeleton with metal. Uh -huh. So there are 16 known species. They had all these different horn-shaped, this horn up on the, the forehead, and their mandibles are super weird. Ant mandibles today are like that side-to-side -side opening and closing, like, jaws. Yeah, like, you know, complex tweezers. Hell ants tended to have both mandibles shaped kind of, the way they were described as, like, scythes or sickles. They curve upwards like tusks. What? It's a pair and they're like tongs sticking upwards in front of the face. And for a long time, people have remarked upon hell ants for being super weird and also what, why? <laughs> what are, why do you have all these weird facial things? Especially since, as they mention in this paper, there are about 15,000 living species of ants and none of them look like this. No. This is an extinct morphology that belonged to this group of Cretaceous ants. This study did a big phylogenetic comparison across different ants to, to try and get an idea of what's going on, and also describes a specimen in Burmese amber. So Burmese amber, uh, Cretaceous, 99 million years old or so, in the amber is a single worker of a hell ant of the species Ceratomyrmex ellenbergeri. It is also associated in the amber with a nymph of another insect, a cockroach cousin, or something cockroach-like, named Caputoraptor elegans, and what makes this specimen so unique and informative is that the ant is using its face against the other insect. Oh. It is frozen in time, showing us how it used these weird structures on its face. Thank you, little ant. And here's how it was using them. It had its upward-curving mandibles and its horn around the neck, quote-unquote neck, of the other bug. The mandibles hooked underneath and closed upwards against the horn. So like a th three-fingered grip. Yeah, like a three-fingered grip. Huh. Apparently, this hell ant, and presumably a lot of the others, used their mandibles and their horns on their heads 
together as a vertical set of jaws. That's so cool. Super weird. Now, why is this weird? Number one, ants today don't do this. Nope. Ants and insects in general use their jaws side to side. Mm -hmm. Like you said, like tweezers, but side to side closing. Yes. Number two, this is super cool because it shows that they have, as the paper uh, term the paper used, integrated the head and the mandibles. Yes. Like these are two different parts of the body that are now working in conjunction with each other to do something that they otherwise couldn't do. In this case, a predatory behavior. And number three, they made, it was this a little note in the paper. They point out that this is analogous to vertebrate skulls. What? Because that's what we do. You're not wrong. We have a mandible that cl- opens and closes against the top of the head <laughs> for a vertical bite. And that's kind of what these ants have evolved to do. <laughs> that's cool. Which is so cool and so weird. This has been, and now this isn't like a whole revelation. People had wondered that. Mm-hmm. People had suspected it, especially since I mentioned the one with the paddle yeah. shaped horn that was reinforced. It had been suggested that maybe it was reinforced because the lower, the mandibles were closing against it. You're basically stabbing yourself <laughs> with your, your mandible sides. Wait, you've, you've put a thumb on your forehead, and so you need it to be structural you know it can't just be decorative right you need you need it to not get damaged when you bite something yes. and clamp against yourself but it is direct evidence of how they were using it and they were using it in a way no ants or insects to my knowledge use their faces today yeah what it makes me think of david showed me a picture of these and what it made me think of when i saw them was the stag beetles that have the two specialized mandibles that, like, you know, stag beetles are the ones with the two big, you know, chomping mandibles that are giant for fighting other males. One of them, and I don't remember which one it is, has these arches to the mandibles. The where they, the mandibles come out, and they bend upward, and then they bend back down. So they look like those really complicated surgery tweezers to, like, reach around stuff. And it's to be able to reach over the top and under the wing casing of another male to lift them off a branch and flick them off a tree. So very specialized for competition. And that's they have that look to it. But now they make me think of the rhinoceros beetles where they have the horn on their head and then a horn on their back mm-hmm. that makes the closing jaw. It clamps. Yeah. That they are lifting their head when they're quote-unquote jaw closes and it's closing up against a projection on their back yeah these ants have done that but it's their mandible and a projection on their head of their face to their face and i love it and also if it's a wrapping around the neck it makes me wonder was this a was this something you could have dismembered with or is this just like all right you all go and restrain it with your jaws and then we'll come in and like oh yeah was this a specialized tool just for grabbing or was it doing actual mechanical work? And ah, I'm so interested. I did read the, there was another paper. I was super into it. So I kept reading. Yes. That another species, which is named after Vlad the Impaler. (laughs) It was suspected. This is the one with the paddle was suspected to have clamped against prey and then drained them. Oh. So you bite and then suck the juices out while biting so that you're not actually dismembering. I don't know how much into detail they went into the the morphology of that. They might not be feeding like today's ants of dismembering and carrying back, but this lets me lock onto you like a a leech's mouth. Yeah. Oh, that's so much more horrifying. I love it. Now, in this paper, they also did a comparison across different hell ants to do an ancestral, you know, evolutionary reconstruction. And they found a couple little additional notes. One, these ants appear to have branched off of the ant lineage before modern ants as we know them. Okay. So this is a very ancient branching off of ants. And all the hell ants are related to each other. And it seems that this change in jaw and face structure allowed a radiation yeah. of different facial features of different species in this diversity because and they even mentioned that the horn shapes 
are not only diverse, but long horns appear to have evolved multiple times. Oh. That they that ancestrally got a weird mandible thing going on and then radiated into a bunch of different species that took advantage of it. So, a, a very fascinating and fun group of ancient ants. You wouldn't think that ants could get like weirder. more yeah, weirder, <laughs> more ridiculous, more diverse, more surprising. But there you go. Hell ants. Uh, you mentioned the picture. Uh, as always, we will have a link to the press release in our blog. So click that and check out the cool pictures. Yes, please do, because they're awesome. Man, I love ants, which is not something that comes up in the podcast often. but It doesn't. Hint, hint. It is one of my favorite groups of insects. Uh, close to the favorite, just depending on my mood. And now the, these are strong additions to the list of animals I'm very depressed aren't here anymore. <laughs> cool stuff. Well, speaking of really weird animals that we weren't sure what they were doing until maybe recently, Tanistrophius. I know that. Yeah, so Tanistrophius was this reptile during the Age of Dinosaurs, Triassic, that had a ridiculously long neck. Now, when I say ridiculously long, we are talking about an animal that, in total, the largest ones were about 6 meters long, which is about 20 feet long. Of that 20 feet... The neck accounted for so much of it, it was about three times the length of the body. Yeah, and these aren't like sauropods or giraffes. or They're, they're kind of lizard-shaped. Yes. With super long necks. So think if you, t if you took like a Komodo dragon-esque body and then stretched the neck out to where it was three lengths of the body. Yep. And you have a tannistrophid. Yeah. It's very strange. Very weird. And people have been debating on what they've been doing with that neck, but also where they lived with that neck. Mm -hmm. They've been found in coastal areas, but were they swimming or were they coastal and feeding into the water more like a stork? And people have not been able to agree. This new research leans things toward an aquatic lifestyle. Okay. So it may actually give us some information about how these weird reptiles were living. This is research by... Stefan Speakman et al. in Current Biology, and the article we'll be linking to is in The Guardian by Nicola Davis. So, Tanistrophius uh, unearthed 150 years ago, so we've been asking this question for a long time. Sure have. In Germany, initially. Has all those weird features we just mentioned, and this research took a closer look by CT scanning, micro CT scanning, a number of specimens to reconstruct the skull in detail. And get a good look at what the facial features were of these tanistrophids. The results showed that the nostrils were on top of the snouts. And this, along with interlocking teeth, teeth that fit together like when you lace your fingers uh, between one another, suggests to the researchers an aquatic lifestyle. That sure seems to fit. Yep. The interlocking teeth are very common among fish eaters, things catching swimming prey. That it's going to form a cage for yep. those things. And the nostrils on top of the skull is very characteristic of things that breathe air but live in the water. Because then you don't have to stick your face out. You just have to break the surface. Right. Crocodiles, hippos, dolphins, etc., etc. Putting your nose on top is really good if you're an air breather in the water. Now, there were various sizes of specimens they looked at. And the smaller specimens had less, as they put it, croc-like skulls that seemed to be less flattened, less, you know, uh, adjusted for the water surface, they may have either been less aquatic or spent more time out of water than the larger specimens, which seem to have been, if not wholly aquatic, very aquatic. And the growth lines on these smaller specimens did indicate that they were not young tanistrophids, but small tanistrophids. Okay. With the smaller ones just being about a meter and a half in length, so four to five feet. Which is also interesting because it means that there were different sized species of Tanistrophius occupying the same environment together. Yeah, but possibly in different parts of that yeah, habitat. Niche partitioning, yeah. taking advantage of different aspects. So it would make sense if one was more aquatic and one was less aquatic, so they aren't competing with one another. In this research, they were also able to name a couple of new species. The larger of the specimens that they looked at was named Tanistrophius hydroidus, named after the hydra. Cool. Right. And the smaller one was Tanistrophius longobardicus. And so, yeah, 
potentially some information on a really, really, really weird reptile into how it was actually living. Much like the hell ants, uh, Tanistrophia, we just don't have a thing that's like that today. Nope. And it makes it very difficult to know what they were doing. I remember it wasn't too long ago that there was another study that came out about Tanistrophians that had found, if I remember correctly, a early member of the group from, I think, South America. And its habits, they, they, uh, the authors were trying to interpret as evidence, perhaps, of the ancestral mm. habitat. I don't remember if it was aquatic or terrestrial. Yeah. Whatever it was, they the, the authors were saying, hey, that might be what the ancestral condition was. And this story would be much better if I knew, if I remembered what their conclusion was. <laughs> well, and this research also is not one of those where it was, my goodness, people have been recreating Tenostrophius swimming for a long time right. now. That is, t to my knowledge, the predominant yes. hypothesis that they were at least partially aquatic. But they ran it, the Tenostrophius runs into the same issue as the long-necked plesiosaurs in that all right, we we all are mostly agreeing that you're in the water, but we still don't know what you're doing yeah. with that long neck in the water. So this one had that extra question of okay, but maybe maybe it wasn't. Maybe the neck is useful somewhere else on the beach. Yeah, you know, ah, very interesting to to oh, like what like we mentioned with the Hellans, diversity among a really weird group of animals. Yeah. So yeah, they're doing a variety of things. And that's really neat. Yeah, there's not just one kind of weird. Be your own kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> My next bit of news is about dinosaur cancer. Wah, 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 wah. This is research by Sepper Ektiari et al. in The Lancet Oncology, and we'll link to an article in Science by Gretchen Vogel. Dinosaur cancer. So we, uh, episode 84 was all about paleopathology, where yes. our friend Laura came on to talk to us about how we identified injury and disease in fossils. How do we identify cancer? This is an example of that. <laughs> there has been cancer identified in dinosaurs and other ancient creatures before. Uh, there have been tumors identified in sauropods, hadrosaurs, uh, at least Tyrannosaurus has had. There, there among dinosaurs... Uh, researchers have identified both benign tumors and malign oh, cancers. I didn't know that. That's really cool. The difference being that a benign cancer tends to stay in one place. Malignant cancer spreads throughout the body. Yes. And can infect multiple different places and cause all sorts of problems. This research identified cancer in a ceratopsian. Episode 87. The ceratopsian in question is Centrosaurus which is from roughly 76 million years ago, late Cretaceous, bone bed in Dinosaur Park in Alberta. The bone in question is a fibula. So one of the two bones in your lower leg, mm -hmm. the smaller one. It's a partial fibula, so it's about two-thirds, the bottom two-thirds or so of the fibula, and the top part of it is all deformed and lumpy. It looks like a club. Yeah. The bone as a whole, because the top is all misshapen and, and it looks like an ogre would pick this up and hit people with it. <laughs> the That is what I thought when I saw the picture is if humans and dinosaurs were around at the same time th that would have made some early human very happy. Absolutely. This is like the, the clubs you get off of the big bokoblins in Breath of the Wild. <laughs> <laughs> yes it is. Originally when this fossil was discovered researchers had presumed that this deformation was a healed break. Like we talked about in episode 84, if something breaks, it heals back all weird. But these researchers took a renewed look at it and identified it as osteosarcoma, a, t a form of bone cancer. The research team that investigated it included a combination of paleontologists, pathologists, a surgeon, and a radiologist. That's so awesome. Like medical people got involved in this study. I love studies like this because this is when it feels like we're in a, a the, the science portion of a, of a movie. So we oh, yeah. called all the top scientists in the country yep, you know, to, to study to this thing. Figure this out. And I love it because it's, it's, <laughs> these are those real world event versions of that. Now, osteosarcoma, uh, like I said, it's a cancer that invades bones. In humans, humans get it. Uh, it typically goes after the leg bones in teens. Okay. So it's a cancer that is most prevalent during the stage of life where your bones are growing very quickly. Yeah, growth spurts. Yep. And so that the cancer can form during that time. 
There has been at least one other presumed case of osteosarcoma in a Triassic turtle. <laughs> but huh. the authors point out that in all these other known cases of dinosaur cancers or that turtle example, the identification has been based on the shape of the growth and weirdness and, you know, radiographic studies. But a proper diagnosis in the modern sense requires cellular identification. Oh. And previous studies have not done that. This study did that. So this study uh, looked at this bone and compared it to a human example. In fact, they, they discussed it in the paper. It's not very often that a paleontological study has to go through an IRB, <laughs> uh, Institutional <laughs> Review Board. But this, this study needed to borrow someone's amputated leg from a medical facility wow. to compare. So, yeah, it's it's very strange for a paleontology study. They looked at the morphology, they took CT scans, and they took thin sections of the dinosaur bone to study the histology. Woo! The microscopic cellular level of tissue uh, uh, structures. And all that together, with comparison to a human case, led them to conclude that this was a malignant case of osteosarcoma in this dinosaur. That's pretty cool. Not only that, but it was a an advanced case. Yes. They said in the paper that if, if we saw this in a human, it would likely be fatal. <laughs> but they don't think, or at least it was mentioned uh, 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 briefly in the science article, not necessarily fatal for this dinosaur mm. because it's buried in a bone bed, which means it's buried alongside lots and lots and lots of other centrosaurs that died in, I think, a flood is the reigning hypothesis here a natural disaster that wiped them all out so this dinosaur probably didn't die of its cancer at least it hadn't died yet yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and then a disaster came through and wiped it and all of its friends out it's, I, I'm, I'm picturing that centrosaurus finding out it has bone cancer and then but good news is it's not gonna kill you yep <laughs> that's what it's the magic eight ball yep. said no don't even worry about it yeah don't don't worry about this Right. <laughs> it's, it's the genie way. You got to yeah. really pay attention well, to the this wording. Is a, this is a monkey's paw situation. Oh, I sure hope that this cancer doesn't kill me. Ding! Granted. <laughs> oh, that's dark. Just a bit. A little bit. <laughs> but I do love the interdisciplinary stuff yields such cool stuff. Like them ha comparing to human medical studies. Right. How often do you have a study where you put a human bone and a dinosaur bone side by side to conclude things about it? And that's what I love that about crossing disciplines because every now and then there's tons of stories of people being like, we're trying to figure this out. And another group of scientists being like, well, we've got a tool that do does that. Oh yeah. But it just doesn't in this situation. They go, C can we use it? And then you get awesome studies like this. You sure do. Well, speaking of things that kill dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Dinosuchus. Meteors. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> amateur kill dinosaurs then. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. For, for, the, for the, the semantic nerds out there like me, asteroids. Asteroids. Meteorites. Mm -hmm. you're, you're right. I apologize. <laughs> I heard you all and you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, felt, I felt a disturbance as though... Oh, many, 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 many nitpicky voices cried out. Yes. <laughs> and would not be silenced. Dinosuchus. Dinosuchus. The giant killer crocodile, quote unquote, from the age of the dinosaurs. This is a famous, famous croc cousin. These, this species, this genus grew to sizes over 30 feet, some almost reaching 40. Yeah. This is m movie star Croc size. Yeah, so we're by for everyone else, ten meters and yeah. more. <laughs> Compared to the largest crocs today, which are salties that get up yeah. to like twenty feet. The biggest one ever six meters or so. Broke twenty feet by three inches. Which is huge, <laughs> but oh yeah. That is as big as crocodiles get today. These are monstrous ones. Also, their skulls are as long as me and David. So two meters, each. six feet. Yes. Not together. Not together. But like each. We each <laughs> would be a good sized skull. These have often been considered to be predators of dinosaurs based on a couple of fossil evidence, but this study is the first to look at, could they actually do that? 
Could they actually take down something the size of a dinosaur? Right. Or is that just our fancy story yeah. that we like to think Did of? Did we just look at big crocodile, big food? Surely. This is research by Adam Cosette and Chris Brochu in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And the article we'll be linked to is in phys.org by Taylor and Francis, the publishers. This study focused on the skull of Dinosuchus of multiple specimens to see what could this skull actually do and to get a better picture of it. Because up until now, we did not have a good, complete specimen. Oh, interesting. So we didn't really know what tool it was taking to task to maybe kill dinosaurs with. And this research is in response to a new specimen that's been found that is a much more complete overall. And the study revealed a few interesting things. First, that there were various kinds of dinosuchus around here in North America, which is where they're known from. There were two species, Dinosuchus hatcheri and Dinosuchus riograndensis, which lived in Western America uh, from Montana to Mexico. And then Dinosuchus schwimmeri, which lived along the Atlantic coast from New Jersey to Miss Mississippi. Oh, so we had eastern and western yes. super crocs. Which makes sense, because during this time, North America was split in half by the intercoastal seaway. That's right. Episode 71. Hey, Dinosuchus is an alligatoroid, isn't it? It is. It is not actually okay. a crocodile. I, was, I had that in my head. I was mm -hmm. like, it's, it's a gator cousin. Yes. And so it's not a crocodile or an alligator, but it fits in the alligator side of things, not the crocodile. Right. And it didn't look like either. It has a weird face. It had a very broad and long snout. So, like, not surfboard surfboard, but it was not skinny and narrow like most crocodiles. And it was not that shovel-shaped like an alligator because the nostrils flare out into this big, expanded nasal opening. And as far as that opening goes, they have no idea <laughs> what that was. And it's not the only one of, like, there are other crocs with weird st stuff like that. That we're not sure what that is, but they describe that Dinosuchus's facial features are fairly unique to Dinosuchus. Interesting. That, that big opening was for sucking up pterosaurs yeah. as they flew by. <laughs> Just snorting prey. <laughs> but what they also found was that the mechanics of the skull and, as they put it, banana-sized teeth <laughs> <laughs> would absolutely have been able to take down even decently sized dinosaurs. Cool. Which... Dinosuchus would have been able to do, considering not only their size, which as we mentioned gets up into like the 30 foot range. Yeah, 10 meters ish. But they outweighed even large terrestrial predatory dinosaurs. Cool. So like big theropods that were ra roaming North America during this time, Dinosuchus at their largest size would have outweighed because when you're in the water, you're able to get big and fat. Yeah. <laughs> and crocs put on tons of weight at their big sizes. And the heavier you are, the bigger things you can kill. It's The math just works that way. And this is supported by marks, bite marks on dinosaur bones. So we'd suspected it for a long time, but the mechanics suggest that, yes, they absolutely could have taken down dinosaurs, but they were probably also taking down other things. There are bite marks on turtle fossils and things like that as well. That makes sense. So much like today's crocs and gators, at this size... Anything in the water with Dinosuchus was on the menu. Yeah. We actually talked about that in the Ask a Scientist podcast yes. that we were on. Uh, one of the kids asked, what do alligators eat? And we discussed at length, will yep. you describe? <laughs> but the answer is, yeah, basically, if it gets in front of them and it fits in the mouth. Yep. That. That's it's on the <laughs> menu. They also noted two holes at the end of the snout. Oh. In the tip of the upper jaw that... They aren't sure what they're for. Uh, they they didn't see exactly. What it made me think of is many crocs, and people may not know this, actually have teeth that poke up through the jaw. Right. They actually have holes for their teeth. And like the mugger crocodiles in India, I know are really well known for this. While their mouth is closed, you can see their bottom teeth. Not like tusks, but like a nose ring yep. sticking through holes in the snout. Yep, punctured. Oh, it made me think of that, but I also assumed they would have thought of that. And yeah. so if they did Chris, Chris Brochu is aware of that. Yeah, sure. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so evidently they have some weird holes there at the, the tip. Interesting. 
I, it's always fun to get confirmation. Like the hell ants. Yes. I'm going to try to say like the hell ants as many times <laughs> as possible. It's new like, catchphrase. Like the hell ants, which will also be the name of my biker gang. <laughs> like the hell ants. Uh, you know, we had this structure. We had this animal. And it's easy to say, oh, well, that's probably what it was doing with that. And yes, but you never know when it's going to turn out that the obvious answer isn't actually true. Yeah, well, it makes me think of Smile It On. I was just going to say, yeah. it's like saber tooth cats. Yeah. The obvious answer in the early days was not that they were stabbing stuff with it. Big teeth for big prey. And that's probably not true. Listen to the last episode yes. about cats. So even when the answer is, yes, we were probably right. It's always good to have that, and it's, it's ve it can be very easy to forget that we have these sort of common understandings of a lot of ancient animals that aren't actually supported. Yes. The most famous example, perhaps, is pack hunting in mm -hmm. dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor. Super common. Everyone thinks of it. Very popular way to depict them. But as we've discussed in previous episodes, the evidence is actually very shaky on whether or not they were doing that. There's really only one finding that propo that led to the proposal and since then has not gotten further continued yeah, there's support. There's been a few bits studies here and there that have found support, but it's not a definite thing by any means. So it's always nice to get confirmation for the thing we assumed <laughs> to be true in the first yes. place. Just because it makes sense doesn't mean it is. And speaking of dogs... Yep. <laughs> I only got one for this one. <laughs> speaking of hell ants... And speaking of hell ants, dogs, we will be talking about them after the break. <laughs> <laughs> 94 episodes in, we're starting to lose the yeah, shine. We're mastering the segue. I've always been more of a cat person. <laughs> So, David, have you ever heard of a dog? I have met one or two. Dogs? The hot, the hot kind. <laughs> the hot dog. It's my favorite with chili, some relish. Dogs, as we've said with cats, it feels it feels ridiculously silly for me to explain what a dog is. Yeah. I, I That feels like, okay, so could you describe what a nose is? Yeah. It, it, they, they are ubiquitous. It's a dog. In human society. It's... It's a dog. Dogs are one of the most prominent groups of mammals today because we have taken them everywhere. Because we did that. But even before that, they are found in most major environments on most of the continents, minus Australia and Antarctica, and we've brought them to one of those. <laughs> yep. Much, much like cats. Yep. <laughs> we took them to the place that they weren't in the first place. So... We'll get into where they fall within mammals, but first, what is a dog? Canids. Yes, canids. The group that consists dogs and all their cousins are part of the carnivorans, the, the mostly carnivorous group of mammals, and they are characterized by a number of features that will probably sound very familiar to most of us. Unlike cats, which we talked about last episode, dogs are much more about the long, slender features because they are runners and their body shows that long slender but powerful legs toes that are grouped together and facing forward not splayed out so they're not hands they are feet for running blunt non-retractive claws so they're not doing much with the claws other than grabbing the ground and pushing they're also notable for having really good stamina anyone who ever has played with a dog <laughs> can see they do not tire easily. And as far as their looks go, dogs have much longer muzzles, snouts, than a cat does. Cats have very flat faces. Dogs have this, you know, that wolf snout. Long, long ears, typically pointed, with a fairly long tails that are not as mobile and flexible as a cat's, and typically bushy. Mm -hmm. They're also typically not as colorful as cats. Yeah, cats, I, like we discussed, a lot of striping and spotting in cats. And it's not to say that you don't have striped or spotted canines, but most are either uniform or kind of just more gradients with like darker to lighter, 
or in grays to browns. Right. More like a lion than a tiger. Yeah. And lots of them are very, you know, darker colored and fairly mundane colors. You know, not very exciting, but good for the environments they're typically found in. Right. Yeah, we talked in Cats about how stripes and spots are great for if you're in the tall grass mm -hmm. or the forest and stuff. And animals with more flat colors are often found in more open habitats. Absolutely, which is where most dogs, most canids, excel. Yeah. And that running body plan is great for an open environment where you are using your stamina to chase down prey. But one of the things that is oh so special about dogs is their senses. They have good eyesight and great hearing. Mm-hmm. As is the case with many predators. Yeah. They've got, like cats, they have forward-facing eyes, yep. binocular vision. Focused on the target. But their sense of smell is arguably almost second to none in the animal kingdom. There are very few animals that can be compared to a dog. But specifically within mammals, as far as I found, no <laughs> mammals are compared to dogs when it comes to sense of smell. Super smellers. Their smell is so ridiculously powerful. Compared to our own, some of the numbers I found rated dogs as 10,000 to 100,000 times more acute than our sense of smell. Wow, I know I found a, a reference that said that, I think it said that cats, the density of smelling nerves mm -hmm. in a cat's snout are about half of what you see in dogs yeah, in general. Yeah, dogs are superb for odor detection. Everything about that front of their face is designed for smell. The long snout gives more space for receptors. They can have up to 300 million olfactory receptors. Whew. Smell receptors, which we have about 6 million. Wow. <laughs> The part of a dog's brain that is devoted to smell is, proportionately speaking, 40 times bigger than our own. And 12% of the air they inhale is diverted specifically just for smell. Oh, interesting. So part of their breathing is not even going to the lungs. It is getting waylaid into this nasal cavity, this labyrinth of very thin bones at the back of the snout, the nasal passage there, that collects the air and just swirls it through this intricate, as they put, labyrinth of smell receptors and sensory areas to just analyze that air. They also have two slots on the edge of their nostrils, which I'm sure anyone who has ever been face-to-face -face with your dog has noticed. <laughs> their, their nostrils look like little commas. <laughs> yep, it's got like a slot off yep. to the side. Because when they exhale, the air goes out to the side through that S slot. So it's not mixing? So it's not mixing with the next sniff. And also, the airflow that creates helps move in the new air. Oh, cool. So a dog can take more sniffs a second than we can because of the efficiency. So they're able to, you know, if there's a stream of air coming past them, they can sniff it quicker than a less developed nose <laughs> would be able to, cool. to get a more continuous analysis. And they also, as you mentioned with cats, have the vomeral nasal organ, the Jacobson's organ, which is mainly used, it's for them at the front uh, of the nasal passage, the bottom there, and it's mainly used for picking up pheromones. Okay. Due to this strong sense of smell, they also are big into scent marking. They mark their territories, like many mammals, but they are very big into marking with scent. They do tend to hold pretty rigid territories, especially those that are highly social, which is many of the canines. Yes, another distinction between dogs and cats. Yes, while with cats it was the exception in lions, it's, I don't quite want to say the rule, because there's plenty of solitary canids out there. Oh yeah. But many of the especially well-known groups are not just social, but highly social. Right. Very, very group-oriented. Especially bonded with one another. Some are with each other throughout their whole life. And this aids them in the fact that canids are also predominantly, and many of them entirely, carnivorous, predatory. Yep. There are some omnivorous, you know, or more omnivorous canids out there. But there's no herbivorous, 
And for those predatory canids that are social, this aids them in taking down ridiculously large prey compared to their body size, which is one another thing they are known for. Yep. Their teeth are also very different than a cat's in the fact that they have not reduced and highly specialized them. They have 42 teeth, so they still have a bunch of teeth. Yeah, they basically have the ancestral placental mammal set of teeth. Yeah, like minus one or two here or there. They basically kept all the teeth. Their incisors are not very specialized. They're pretty much your typical incisor, the front teeth. Yep, sort of spatula shaped. Yeah. The canines are, you know, prominent and are canines. <laughs> like, it's the group is, <laughs> the, the names are shared between the group and the two. You have the canine teeth. Yes. Their premolars are narrow and sharpened. Yep, blade-like. And then their carnasials, the thing that these two groups share is what the carnivorans are known for, are well-developed in dogs, but typically less shearing in many of them than a cat. Though there are those that share that very blade-like carnasial mm -hmm. and are much more carnivorous than those without. But the back of the molars are... More crushing, more like our molars, to be able to take in a variety of foods. Yep. Also good for, like, bone cracking and things yes. like that. So we talked with cats about how cat teeth are basically all spikes and blades. Yep. And they've gotten rid of most of them so that they can have a mouth that is just spikes and blades. It's just shears. It's just, all on the front, it's spikes, and in the back, it's blades, and you're just stabbing and slicing. Dogs have... A more specialized than our mouth, but still a bit more generalized to be able to take on kind of whatever they find. Right. And like some, especially like foxes, which we'll get into what that means, are very omnivorous. You know, eating a wide variety of things throughout the year, more like a bear, you know, when you typically mm -hmm. think of their diet, where they will happily take a berry just as quickly as they'll take a piece of meat. Uh, because one's available more often and doesn't run away. So dogs are less focused, though there are some both today and in the fossil record that have been labeled as hyper carnivorous. Right. Eating almost entirely diets of meat. So they are still predatory. They are still a group of predators, just a little less extreme in that regard than the cat. And they're also hunting in a very different way. Yes. As reflected by the, these anatomical features we talked about how cats, their faces are taken up in large part by their eyes. Mm -hmm. They're very visual as opposed to scent. Yes. How cats are very flexible and their cat cats are wrestlers mm -hmm. while dogs are chasers. And they also talk about that dogs typically kill their prey differently than a cat does. Mm -hmm. While many cats go for that killing bite that I chomp onto your throat or your snout and this action is what kills you. Right. I'm either going to destroy your throat or I'm going to suffocate you yeah. with this bite. Dogs are less precise in that they usually kill their prey when they start to eat it. <laughs> in that dogs are just going to mob the prey item, biting and tearing, and then death comes from that. <laughs> and I always like to I always like to take it back to the way pet cats play versus the way pet dogs play. Mm -hmm. That a cat grabs a thing falls over, and then gets at it with its claws in its mouth, a dog plants itself, bites down, and shakes and pulls and yep. shakes. and mangles it. So where do dogs fall out in mammals? Like, where do they fall out in our mammal group? They fall out in carnivora just like the cats. Mm -hmm. We mentioned carnivora last episode, but as a reminder, this is the mostly carnivorous, mostly predatory group of mammals that is characterized by those carnasial teeth Right. With One, a few exceptions that have lost it. Right, right, right. Carnasial teeth is a pair of special teeth uh, on each side, one premolar, one molar, yeah. that typically are fitting together for shearing or to basically do whatever, th the most extreme version of what that animal needs its yes. mouth to do. It's a mechanical set of teeth for whatever feeding strategy they're using. When your dog chews on a bone and it brings it back to the cheek, that the carnasials are what it's using. Exactly. Now, this group is split mainly into two groups, the feliforms and the caniforms. Mm -hmm. 
We talked a lot about the Felaforms last episode. These are your cats and their closer cousins. Cats, hyenas, meerkats, mongooses, etc. And then the Caniforms are the dog-like carnivorans. And they include bears, the red panda, you know, not true bear, skunks, all your mustelids, so weasels, badgers, uh, wolverines, ferrets, otters, wolverines, etc. Uh, exactly. Your raccoons and their group. The pinnipeds which include your seals, sea lions, and walruses. Yeah. And then the canids, specifically the family canidae, which includes all dogs and their allies, so to speak, all of their cousins. United by the plesiomorphic trait of going to heaven. <laughs> yes, exactly. Inside the family canidae, there are three subfamilies, only one of which is around today. The okay. caninae. Canines. Yes, canines. The other two we will talk about Shortly. Uh, foreshadowing. The Caninae, the canines, make up 12 genera, which include around 36 species. Today. Living, today. living species. Living today. There are 12 groups with a little over 30 species, and they include... Let's learn. Now, most of these genus that we're going to talk about, most of these genera, only include one species. Mm -hmm. And so, for most, it's this genus with that dog, and then there's a few that you'll recognize. The genus Kuan, which includes the Asian canid, the Dole, mm -hmm. which is also known as the Asian wild dog, or Asianic wild dog, Indian wild dog, whistling dog, mountain wolf. You'll notice that a lot of terms for canines get used interchangeably. Yeah, dog, wolf, dog, fox, wolf, etc. Now, this is not a true wolf, but it is often compared to them, uh, to having features somewhere between a wolf and a fox. And we'll get to fox in just a moment. But these kind of look like, you know, if you can picture a dingo, it kind of looks like that with the darker colors. You have genus, the genus Nycterudes, which is the raccoon dog, also in Asia. But most of you probably would recognize this better if I called them tanukis. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, these are the famous in tons of anime. Also Mario. Tons of Mario games. <laughs> These are the famous raccoon dogs. Not raccoons, not dogs as we recognize them. They are a canid that is actually ha is named raccoon dog because of a similar mask-like patterning around its face and is one of the only canids to be arboreal, to spend lots of its time climbing trees. Oh, that's right, which is a very cat thing to do. Very cat thing Al to do. Also a very raccoon thing to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Pay attention to... That that behavior exists in canines, because we'll get into that when we go into their history a bit more. Oh. Now, the raccoon dog is a closer relative of true foxes. And I preface true, because a lot of these groups are called foxes, but only vulpes is the one that is considered true foxes. Right. Quote, unquote, true foxes. Because we said so. Well, yeah, because that they were the first ones we called foxes. And when I say we, I mean Western yeah. people. <laughs> this is one of the big groups of canines. Twelve species throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. These include your red fox, they include the arctic fox, they include the finnick, the desert fox, with the big adorable ears. Yeah. Foxes are typically more slighter in their build than you would think of most canines. They're typically compared to be more cat-like, you know, so to speak, and they often have more prominent patterning. You know, the, the red fox being that very striking red, white, and black patterns. But they are a very successful group with a very wide range of habitats and diets. These are also typically a bit more omnivorous than the more carnivorous groups. To give you an example of one of these not fox foxes, because we said so, is the crab-eating fox, genus Cerdocyon, which is there's only one species in South America, and it's a bit more stout in its build compared to what you would typically picture a fox looking like. It shares its South America habitat with the South American foxes, genus Lycolopex, which includes six different species of fox-like canid, but are actually more closely related to wolves and jackals. Okay. But have convergently evolved to a very fox-like overall shape and demeanor. These are often known as Zorro in Spanish, and so... If you ever see that with a name, it's typically talking about one of these. We also have the genus Eurocyon, which is the gray foxes found in North and South America. 
These are interesting because they both have interesting habitats and behavior. The island fox, which is one of these two species, is only found on the Channel Islands off the coast of California. They're found on six of the eight islands, and on each island is a different subspecies. Interesting. Right? Island foxes. And then the gray fox, which is found from southern Canada to Venezuela, from very far reaching across the Americas, is often considered the most basal of living canids. Interesting. The outgroup. The outgroup. The more closer uh, uh, in its relation to the ancestors and is the only other canid group to climb trees regularly. Interesting. And it even has strong hooked claws to be able to climb more easily. Then we have the bat-eared fox, genus Otosion, which is found in Africa and is named for very big ears that are most likely for thermoregulation as these are found on the African savanna. These are also interesting because majority, and according to the paper I looked up, 80 to 90% of their diet is m consisted of termites. Oh, that's right. These are mostly insector insectivorous canids. Which is a very interesting thing for a, a relatively large carnivoran to do. Right? They'll eat other stuff. They've been known to eat more normal things, but most of their things are not just termites, but harvester termites. They even are specialized on one particular group. And there are some termites that they are reported to avoid. Interesting. So, very specialized canid. Very cool. And now that we're in Africa, we have to mention genus Lycaon, the African hunting dogs. Yeah! Or painted wolf, or painted dogs, or cape hunting dogs, or wild hunting dog, or African wild dog. These are, they have that mottled, pretty, pretty coat with just the blotches of brown, black, and white, and tan all over, and are famous for their pack hunting behavior. Yeah. These dogs are really well known. They're hyper carnivorous. They hunt typically large prey out on the open plains and are known for incredible teamwork and being like major stamina hunters, just running for ridiculous amounts of time to tire their prey out. Yeah. In a group that is known for pack hunting and stamina performance, this is the example. But there has been more recent research that has studied groups not living in the savanna and found that they don't hunt that way when they're not in those environments. Which makes sense. Yeah. And the research, they tagged uh, groups of these hunting dogs and then GPS tracked their hunting behavior during chases. And they found that when they were in more densely forested areas, not out on the plains and hunting smaller prey, they tended to make shorter runs, not work together, and another thing these dogs are famous for is being ridiculously successful. Mm -hmm. Like 40 to 80% of their hunts end in kills is what most reports will tell you. This found that 16% of their hunts. Interesting. So what the study points out is that the research showing that they are these ultimate stamina teamwork predators may only be showing that because we're watching, we're observing them when they're easily observed out in the open because in the bush you can't watch them hunt and only when they're hunting big prey that requires heavy amounts of teamwork gotcha in other environments they use much more energy efficient short chases that are less successful but use up less energy interesting so cool very behaviorally uh, adaptable absolutely and it shows us that we may have been leaning on one cool interpretation of these animals when they're more complex. Hopping back to South America, we have the small-eared Zorro, genus Atelosinus, which is the short-eared dog, as it's also known, and is endemic, only found in the Amazonian basin. Okay. And is not what you would typically expect from a canine. They're still slender-limbed, but fairly short compared to the long-limbed running canids you think of. Short rounded ears, very dark colors, and their paws are partly webbed, potentially because of how wet the environment they live in is. I couldn't find any hard research on that to like connect it definitely that they're also better swimmers, but they are described as having partially webbed feet. Cool. Also in South America, you have the maned wolf, genus Chrysoscyon, 
This is the largest canid in South America. They're decently sized. Not quite as big as your actual wolves, but big and long. Not long in their body, but long in their legs. Yeah, they're like stilt-legged. They've been called wolves on stilts. <laughs> uh, and they have this red fur that's very dense with this poof of darker fur right around the neck, which is how they get the name Maned Wolf. Yeah, very striking in appearance. Absolutely. These are very cool-looking canids. They stand out. They look notably different. And then the final South American canid is the bush dog. Only one species. Widespread, but very rare. Very poorly understood. And it has very stout body. Short legs. Stubby little body compared to your typical dog. Short little ears. Dark, dark, dark coloration. What genus is that? This is genus Speathos. Which brings us finally to genus Canis. Hey, I've heard of that. Yeah. The rest. <laughs> this is the rest. This is your coyotes, your wolves, your jackals, and dogs. Dogs. Domestic dogs. Domestic dogs. Familiar dogs. Eight species found worldwide throughout North America, Africa, and Asia naturally, though now they've been brought everywhere else. And the characteristic species of this group is Canis lupus, the gray wolf. This is the wolf. I wasn't even aware until I started doing this research. I didn't know that the wolves that are here in North America and over in Europe and over in Asia are all the same species of wolf. Yep. I wasn't That's aware. <laughs> and part of the reason that it's so easy to not recognize them all as one species is because they have tons of subspecies. In Africa, there's a subspecies of Canis lupus. In Eurasia, there's somewhere between 7 to 12 subspecies and in north america there's somewhere between five and 24 subspecies <laughs> throughout different environments with slightly different names like timber wolf and gray wolf and all that stuff they're typically called the gray wolf they range in color from gray to red to brown to black to whitish and are the ones known for the pack behavior these are your typical pack hunting wolves taking down big prey like large deer and mega herbivores and they hunt everywhere from open plains here in North America, but they also range in elevation and can hunt in wooded areas as well. But they're famous for that open land pack hunting of taking down the sick or injured of a herd. But also in this group, which I wanted to mention because it won't typically be listed when you look up Canis, is the red wolf. The red wolf is the eighth species of Canis. Possibly. Maybe. Possibly. Sometimes. maybe. <laughs> Most importantly, currently. Currently. Legally. Legally speaking. <laughs> the red wolf is a group of Canis that here in North America was well known before the 20th century and during the 20th century was driven out of its habitats here in eastern U.S. and effectively driven to extinction. Just before it was wiped out, a few specimens were collected and brought into a breeding program from Texas and Louisiana, and those have been re-released into protected breeding populations in North Carolina, most notably. But after that, controversy came up about whether these red wolves were actually red wolves or if red wolves were actually a thing, because as research went into them, it was found that they interbreed heavily with coyotes and gray wolves, and that there was significant portions of their DNA that had signs of that interbreeding, and the survivors, where they were collected from, was a area well known to have crossing of the populations. So the question was, were these red wolves, or were these coyotes that had red wolf qualities, or is the red wolf just a hybrid? Right. Is it not actually its own unique species? Exactly. So to answer this question, they first needed to figure out what are the features of a red wolf, whether the ones captured had those features or whether they were a, a mixture. And historically, fossil-wise, is there evidence for red wolves being a distinct group? And this happened uh, just a bit over a year ago when Congress went to U.S. Fish and Wildlife and said, hey, you need to figure this out, <laughs> and tasked them to determine the status of the red wolf, along with the Mexican wolf, uh, which is a subspecies of Canis lupus now. And the current, as of 2019, standing for the red wolf is that it is a species of Canis. 
which is Canis Rufus. Yeah, the Red Wolf. The Red Wolf. <laughs> and so I mentioned that partially because next year <laughs> it could be different. Right. And if we had done this episode at the beginning of the podcast, it would have been a subspecies. Or at least it would have been much more argued. <laughs> right. And it will. there will be arguments so surely in the future. There is still... Some debate and argument, even with this group that we are so familiar with and is so prominent these days. And then we have the other two subfamilies of Canidae, the Barophagines and the, the Hespercyonids. These two, we don't have anymore because they are now extinct. So to talk about them, we'll have to go into the history of Canids after the break. Oh boy, fossil time. To begin our trip into the dog fossil record, I wanted to start us off with the beginning of carnivora with what is generally considered the first carnivoran, or at least the first ancestor to carnivora, which is Miasis, dating back to 55 million years ago, shortly after the end of the Cretaceous. Right, right at the beginning of the Eocene. And is known from Europe and Asia. This is... A very weasel-like animal. Long, slender, flexible body. Slightly bigger than your average weasel today. Probably feasting on small prey items. They were diverse, ranged in size from 1 to 7 kilograms, or just over 2 to 15 pounds. And the reason I wanted to mention this was because, to give some context for how carnivora started, because these are thought likely to have been arboreal tree climbers. Hmm... But their pelvis is more recognizable and is actually a bit dog-like. Okay. So it has a mixture of features. And we see the first of the, the, the idea of dogs here. About 40 to 50 million years ago, somewhere in that range, is when we see carnivora split into the caniforms and feliforms. Yep. So as early as 50 or as late as 43 million years ago, we had... Caniforms, the dog-like carnivorans. Right. Dogs, bears, mustelids, pinnipeds getting their start mm -hmm. ancestrally. And shortly after that, 40 million years ago, we see what is considered the first of the canidae, which is Prohesperocyon wilsoni. It is the first clearly identifiable member of the dog family and arose here in North America in what would have been southeast Texas <laughs> 40 million years ago. Around the same time, as we discussed last time, that the first true cats were getting their start over in Europe and Asia. Absolutely. Now, it had a combination of features that groups it into the canidae. Its teeth, it has lost the upper third molar and has started to trend toward the more shearing bite that canids are known for. And the auditory bulla, which are the big bumps on the back of the middle ear on your skull, are characteristically enlarged, which is a feature of the canids. Yeah, interestingly enough, I didn't mention this in the last episode, but early cats are also identified in large part by the auditory bulla. Mm -hmm. That's that ear-related skeletal structure on the back of the skull. Yeah, they look like little ping-pong balls attached to the back of your and, and bottom of your skulls, their skulls particularly. They also had longer limbs and toes that were more parallel, more closely grouped together, like, like you see in dogs. Like dogs. Like dogs, which may have been starting to help a cursorial running lifestyle. Also at this time is when we see a whole bunch of dog-like things. So were you to glance or time travel back to North America 40 million years ago, you'd see a number of predators that at a glance you'd probably label as a dog, but were not. And so this is where we get some interesting groups that w were not actually convergent to dogs of the time, but convergent to what we know of dogs. Right, a dog-like thing. Well, we discussed in the last episode how there have been a number of groups that have been very cat-like. Yes. The dog bears are the first of this group, which are cananiform. They are in the cananiform group, but are more closely related to bears than dogs. Okay, so they're like kind of dog-like bear cousins. Yep, and their group is the family Hemicyonidae, 
half dog. Half dog, yeah. <laughs> Middle half of its bear. They were around shortly after this time from the Miocene to fairly recently, about five million years ago, and were widespread. They were found in Europe, North America, Africa, Asia, and have been described as bear-like animals that behaved like dogs. Hmm. They seemed like they moved and likely hunted similar to canids. They had longer legs. They ran on their toes, but they had short tails like a bear, yet teeth that were specialized for slicing meat. So eh, a mixture of features. Uh, the biggest of them got up to like, grizzly bear sized. Uh, one of the most famous is Hemision, but seemed like they still had an ability to run long distances and had a hyper carnivorous diet. So dog bears. The other group are the bear dogs. <laughs> <laughs> the Amphicyonids. These are also in Caniformia and also are actually a little bit closer to bears than dogs, but are neither. And these have been described as a, a more dog-like thing that's being more bear-like. <laughs> <laughs> and they also got big, some of them over half a ton. Wow. And they seem like they had a more wolf-like ancestry and became a bit more bear-like so, over so time. The bear dogs are dog-like creatures that are convergent with bears, possibly. And the dog bears are bear-like creatures that are thought to be convergent with dogs. Yeah, we scientists are real good at naming stuff. There's also a living animal called a bear cat, which yep. is neither a bear nor a cat. There's also a breed <laughs> of modern dog called bear dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so when you Google bear dogs, you get a bunch of stuff. Bear cats smell like popcorn. <laughs> I've heard that. Yep. The most famous of this group is Amphicyon, very much like the last group, and weighed over half a ton, but walked on its palms more like a bear, but still had a more elongated body and long tail like a dog. Huh. So, bear dog dog bears. Like, groups that had very similar features to two groups and were yet in neither. Right, well, those early days where different groups of caniformian, caniformian carnivorans were trying out mm -hmm. their own versions of the same things. There are also other groups in South America doing very dog-like things. These weren't even carnivorans, though. The boar hyenidae, which are well-known, they had a huge diversity. So they weren't just dogs. They had bear-like members. They had more weasel and like mustelid like members once again we're comparing a group to our group mm -hmm. because well what else would you compare them to but some of them had very dog-like overall shape to their body and are sometimes called the dog-like marsupials even though they're not a part of what we consider marsupials today they are cousins one description said it would actually be better to call them like giant predatory possums Cool. Uh, <laughs> dog possums. Dog possums. So there were some dog-like, marsupial-like animals down in South America, even though they weren't part of the marsupials we think of today, but doing very dog-like stuff. And some of these, when you see a picture, yeah, they look like a dog. There are also some that take on very uh, hyena-like qualities as well, which is, you know, you can see where the name comes from. Yep. And then much more recently, to like jump forward in time to just yesterday... <laughs> Before we drove it to extinction, the thylacine. Yeah, the Tasmanian wolf. Yes. Or Tasmanian tiger, which is a worse name. Yep. Just because it had stripes. If it has stripes, right. it doesn't well, make like it a those, tiger. Like those tiger horses in yep. Africa. Yeah, tiger horses in Africa and the zebra sharks, uh, which is a thing and it's not the one you'd think it is. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> these are predators found in Australia and Tasmania. Until very recently. Until very recently. That were strikingly convergent. So, so very canid-like. There will be pictures in the blog post of comparisons of their skulls, and it's ridiculous. Despite being true marsupials, as we know them today. So lots of things have... Th the dog-like body form is clearly a winning strategy that has existed since before dogs, as we know them, were a thing. I if I may, like hell ants... Yes! <laughs> Groups outside of what we recognize today doing something successful in their own similar way. And some of these, like I mentioned with the 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 dog bears, were around for a long time. Oh yeah, overlapped with canids. Yes. True, true canids. Directly competing with them. Speaking of true canids, after Prohesperocyon, we get Hesperocyon. Can you see a pattern? Mm-hmm. This is late Eocene, 
So 40 to 35 million years ago. Once again, still endemic here to North America and is known as the Western dog and is starting to seem more dog-like. It's probably about the size of a small fox. The inner ear structure is very characteristic of later dogs. So we're seeing a dog-like inner ear already at this time. There is even some partial evidence, potential evidence, I guess I should say, that they may have lived in communities. Cool. That they may that they weren't solitary, but still not where we expect to see a dog because it seems like they were either up in trees or in burrows. They don't have a open plains body plan yet. Right. Well, you had all those dog bears and bear dogs out there. Exactly. But it was very successful. It's one of the most common mammals in North America fossil record during this time. So, like, they were doing well. They just weren't doing dog yet. Right. They were dog-like, but they weren't doing the dog-like things. Exactly. But this group is important because it's believed to be directly ancestral to the later groups. Gotcha. So now that we see the, the origins of dogs as we know them. Absolutely. Now, to give us some context, during this time, we are entering the Oligocene. So 34 to 23 million years ago, and things are starting to cool down. We're seeing the first ice sheets on Antarctica. We're seeing a general drying out of the middle latitudes, which means here in North America that the forests that these animals had been evolving in are thinning out and opening up to more open, arid landscapes. Yes. This... Less cover, more space. And this is happening at a time where another group of life is starting its journey to world domination. Yes. <laughs> which we discussed in episode 38 about grass. And so we're seeing grasslands take over. Herbivores are having to adapt to an open you know, habitat. Yep. We talked episode 76 about horses. Yep. And in response to those herbivores, predators are also having to adapt to this open hunting ground. During the Oligocene, we see the first initial radiation of the canids into the three major subfamilies. Oh, boy. First is the Hesperocyonids, directly from Hesperocyon. Mm -hmm. They show up around the late Eocene. It's the first of the three subfamilies to evolve and will then eventually give rise to the other two. Okay. And is quite successful. At least 28 species are known from this subfamily, but typically smaller. You know, 80 centimeters, so just over two and a half feet. And... More like a civet or a raccoon. So think more, you know, mustelid, weasley, or a raccoony than dog-like. A bit more bendy, a bit more lanky. Flexible tails as well to go with that. And the limbs seem to have been much weaker and, or much shorter and weaker, not built for powerful running. Okay. So more like a, a weasel mongoose kind of thing than a dog, even though it's one of the three core subfamilies of Canid. Yeah, this is reminding me of the horse conversation. Yes. How the, the earliest members you get that were fully successful were not almost not recognizable in their body shape and behavior as the animals we know today. Absolutely. And something else that's interesting to me about this, still almost entirely endemic to North America. Yeah, they haven't spread out yet. One species has been found, one specimen has been found in China. But other mm. than that one, they're all North American. Interesting. And that's the case for dogs for quite some time. Well, let, over in Eurasia, you still had like, cats were getting yeah. their start. And I have personally seen dogs just avoid cats. Yes. <laughs> and you know what? Who can blame them? <laughs> I mean, I try to. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love them. I love them. They're listening. <laughs> There's one right there. There's I have, right to, there. Yeah, I have to say nice things. <laughs> Next to come out of this initial split are the barophagines. Ooh. The bone-crushing dogs. Oh, it's such a, it's so good. Or hyena dogs. Yep. Due to the bone crushing. Because we like to cross up our names. Yep. These show up a little later in the Eocene, 36 million years ago. They are entirely, they stay in North America the whole time. Their entire history, which is vast. It's not like they were around for a short amount of time. Oh, yeah. And they never left. They were also big. These look like dogs. They are big, powerful predators. They seem to be pursuit predators, evidence of pack hunting. And the feature they're known for is specialized dentition that seems to be for bone crunch crunching. Yeah. When you look at hyenas, I don't know how much we've actually talked about this in hyenas, but yeah, if you ever know. 
get the chance to look at a hyena's skull. Their jaws are big and robust. They've got these huge crests for muscle attachment on the top, and those carnasials we were talking about. Like, some cats have those slicey knife yeah. carnasials. Dogs can sometimes have very big, strong carnasials. Hyena carnasials are scary. It looks like a thumb. Like, it's just placed in there as this nutcracker. Yeah, nutcracker is a great description. <laughs> I always look at it and I think any one of my fingers... Yep would immediately come off <laughs> in I've, between those those teeth. I've watched a video of a hyena eating a vertebra, a backbone, and it took it a matter of seconds, and it would, the audio for it was... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so these are dogs, true dogs. True dogs. That had evolved similar dentition. Very similar. There, once again, will be pictures in the blog post. Now, Very hyena-like jaws. Bone crushers. And this is supported by other fossil evidence because we have poop. Oh, yeah, that's right. I think we talked about this. I think we did. Many, many episodes ago. There are coprolites found in California that have bone fragments in it. They were CT scan and bone fragments were identified on the inside. The size and features, the fact that it has bone, suggest a large predator. And for this area at this time, Borophagus, the most famous of the Borophagines, is really the only candidate. So, unless someone else snuck into the fossil record to leave this poo, <laughs> Borophagus left behind feces with shards of bone in it. Yeah. Which we see in animals like hyenas, T-Rex, we've talked about yeah. animals that are known or thought to crunch up bone with their ridiculous power teeth. Now, whether this is signs of scavenging or that they eat bone after a kill is harder to say. Mm -hmm. uh, Borophagus, which means gluttonous eater, because oh, it's awesome, would have been about 100 pounds. And that's getting up to the size of today's gray wolves, which yeah. max out around 150 pounds typically. So, like, this is big dog, not just a, a decent dog sized. While the largest of the Borophagines, Episcion, has been described as getting up to the size of a grizzly bear. Ooh. <laughs> so there are some out there that were wow. massive. That is too big. That is too much dog. This would that's have a, been... That's a bear dog. This is a bear dog, <laughs> and it would have been the <laughs> largest canid ever. Yeah, and that's a... I don't know how big up getting up to the size of a grizzly bear means, but this is a dog that at the very least is rivaling the biggest cats. Yes. So this Not is... Not necessarily at the same time. No. <laughs> but that's a big dog. Now... There is actually some interesting proposals for why they might have developed this bone-eating behavior, and this goes for hyenas as well, is hyenas are group pack hunters. Mm -hmm. They're group feeders as well. And in their feeding, it's first come, first serve. There's, there is a hierarchy, but it's everyone just starts eating as quickly as they can, and if you aren't there soon enough, there's no food left. Yep. Being able to bite through bone and not having to be picky while you're just inhaling prey, inhaling food, is an advantage in that feeding scenario. Mm -hmm. If the Barophagines were also pack hunters, and if they fed in a similar way, that could be a reason they also developed. Instead of just being the typical scavenging idea, there could be other reasons to evolve this. It also makes me think, because hyenas today live alongside several other large predatory species. Yep. And so it's handy to be able to... Get as much food and nutrition out of a kill as you can, either before lions or someone else comes and chases you away, or afterwards. If yes. you're going into scavenge, you can access nutrition that no one else in your area can get to. Exactly. Though speaking of nutrition, they did note that, according to the coprolite, it appears that Borophagus was not as efficient at breaking down bone as hyenas are, because hyenas Ooh. leave chalky white poops. Yeah. Because they've dissolved the bone. Hyenas are pretty intense. While Borophagus is, seems to have been mostly solid bone. Okay. So they may not have been quite as specialized at digesting bone, at least at that time. Now, during this time, between 30 to 28 million years ago, is when we see the peak of canid diversity, with 25 species of, of canid roaming North America at once. Cool. And that diversity 
peaked then and has yet to be matched since. Wow, that was just the, the, the age of dogs. It is also unequaled by any other single family of carnivorum. Oh yeah, no, that cats were not like that. Mm-hmm. Bears were not like that. Dogs were very successful and with some dips and changes since then, have continued to be very successful. Oh, yeah. And finally, about shortly after that, about 24 million years ago, we see canine, canines. Canine, true canines like today. Yeah, so they were the last of the three subfamilies to evolve, to split off, and were fairly unimpressive. As in, they were <laughs> not very diverse and they were smaller they were the less dominant of the three groups during their initial evolution. And they would stay that way for some time, actually. The first canine is Leptocyon. It's not much bigger than Hesperocyon. So two kilograms, four pounds. Once again, staying fairly small. And in fact, one of their species, uh, Leptocyon delicatus, is known as the smallest canid ever. And so I didn't. They, I did not find weight estimates for that one, but they included not just small, but one of the smallest canids of all time, and were probably very fox-like, very narrow-jawed, very delicate teeth, and likely omnivorous. And they would go on to branch into vulpes, fox, and the canini, the tribe that includes canines. The rest of them. Now at this time we enter the Miocene, twenty-three million years ago up to five. And in North America, we see a diversity of herbivores. It, it, they have, their diversity has been increasing, both due to the natives evolving, but also immigrant species coming to join North America from Eurasian habitats via the land bridges. And 15 million years ago, we see a peak in herbivore diversity here in North America, which has a great effect on the predators. And we see a second peak in the canids at the same time, with some 20 species all here in North America at once. Less so than the first peak, but responding to this influx of prey items, dogs respond, mostly the barophagines. The bone-crushing dogs are the ones really doing well during this time. The Hesperocyonids are on the verge of extinction by this point. So we are almost down to two subfamilies, and the canine are still fairly low profile. We also see that dogs are increasing in speed as the herbivores are getting faster and respond to during this peak, dogs are responding in kind and becoming runners, you know, specialized runners. It's around this time, about 10 million years ago, we see Eusion, which is believed to be a direct descendant from Leptocyon and is jackal size. This is canine again. So this is actual canine and is getting a bit bigger. So Coyote, jackal-sized, you know, a bit smaller than a wolf, medium house dog, you know, domestic dog. And it is proposed, it is thought that this genus gives rise to the genus Canis. So this is the potential direct ancestor to the canines, the the dogs that our dogs come from. Right, wolves, dogs, jackals, etc. Yes. And that would have been about six million years ago that we see Canis come on the scene. This is also at the same time, six to five million years ago, that we see canines invade Eurasia for the first time. Took them a while. Took them a long time. They were North American predators for almost all of their history until half a dozen million years ago that they went boop. And once they move over, they're found in a number of places. Greece, Ethiopia, Mongolia, and many other places in the old world have all had confirmed fossil evidence of canines during this spread. So they spread out quickly, which brings us into the Pliocene. 5.3 million years ago to 1.8. And during that time, about 3 million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama connects and North America and South America can finally start being friends. Episode 43. Yes. And dogs benefit greatly from this because... For the most part, the North American placental predators that moved down to South America did better than the predators that were down there, and canines were not an exception. Yeah. Dogs, cats, bears all started moving down to South America. And canines do very well, which we can see today. 
I didn't count it out when we were going through the groups, but in South America, there are 11 species of Canidae today, which accounts for about one third of today's canines. Good place to be a dog. So South America is the hot spot of diversity today. And it started three million years ago when they were first able to invade. But it is also during this time that the Barophagines start to dwindle down to initially two species. And by the end of the Pliocene, they've gone extinct. So by the end of the Pliocene, it is just the Cananae, the canines okay. that remain. And we are close to a world of dogs that we, wild dogs that we recognize today. Not quite, but close. During this time, we also see Canis, specifically the genus Canis, become the dominant predator across much of the whole Arctic, the northern hemisphere. Right, the place where wolves range exactly. today. Exactly. And wolf-sized predators show up for the first time among Canis. Canis chiliensis in northern China from about four to three million years ago is has reached the size of today's gray wolf or around thereabouts. We also see African migration, canids making their way to Africa during this time with fossils from Kenya dating back to five and a half million years old. And about two million years ago is when we see the first explosion of Canis evolution in Eurasia, which is commonly referred to as the wolf event. <laughs> <laughs> and to now we are seeing a world, if not dominated, but greatly occupied yeah. by dogs. Interesting. The parallel between the oldest recognized members of the most recognizable, largest, and dominant genus of dogs today showing up around four million years ago which is around the same time that we see the oldest fossils of the <laughs> largest and most dominant and most recognizable genus of cats today is i like there's that that's a fun parallel right it's very neat i like it a lot and let's not discover any more fossils yes so that we can preserve that <laughs> yes i like i enjoy it the way it is let's stop let's keep it like that and now we enter the pleistocene the Ice and Age. The climate changes. The Ice Age. The Ice Age. <laughs> things are cold. Things are dry. With and, humid, then and then they're warm and wet. And, and then cold humid and inter dry. intervals uh, yeah. between those. <laughs> and we do see a decrease in the diversity of Canis uh, at the toward the end of the early Pleistocene. So right after the beginning of the Pleistocene, their numbers do dip. Do, 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 do. They're mostly limited to smaller species in Eurasia like small wolf sized with a few large ones still run running around. There's a, the subgenus of Canis Xenocyon, which are larger hyper carnivorous dogs that likely gave rise to the Dole and African wild dogs. Okay. Uh, so there are still some like big players out there during this time, but they, they dipped down here in North America though. We still had some heavy hitters, most famously, the dire wolf. Canis dirus. Canis dirus, which is, oh, such a good name, was a dominant predator here in the Americas in direct competition with Smilodon. Oh, yeah. During the same time. Known famously, uh, as we mentioned in episode 67, from the La Brea Tar Pits. Yes. Where they have just a wall of dire wolf skulls. They have, when we asked them, uh, accounted for approximately 4,000 specimens of Canis dirus at the La Brea Tar Pits, which is just... They... That's all we have to say about that. Yeah, and that's... <laughs> that's you a, can you quote can... us. <laughs> 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 Their time range is from about 125,000 years ago to 9,500 years ago. Yeah, late, latest place to see. Yes. And, and they were widely successful. They ranged from plains and grasslands to the forested environments, mountains, uh, elevation wise, they went from sea level all the way up to 2,200 meters or 7,400 feet. Wow. And they went from the grasslands here to the savanna in South America. So like successful in multiple habitats, but unlike their TV representatives, they weren't much bigger than today's gray wolves. No, they, they were robust. They were robust. They were beefy wolves. Beefy. But they maxed out around 68 kilograms or 150 pounds, which is about as big as today's gray wolves get. And they were just notable for being more robustly built. Their skulls were 
pretty similar, but their teeth were larger with more shearing ability. So they seem to be a bit more hyper carnivorous, you know, strictly meat eating with more force being able to be put on the teeth during biting. Gotcha. Uh, the force put on the canine tooth during a bite in a dire wolf is the strongest of any canis species. So taking down meat and biting harder. They also seem to have been pack hunters and research into injuries in the skeleton support that they were pursuit predators like today's wolves. So lots of research into the prey dynamics for these animals, which we'll link to. But all the evidence points to dire wolves taking down very large prey in a time when there was very large prey in North <laughs> America to take down. And then just at the end of the Pleistocene, we have the megafaunal extinction. Episode 25. Where we lose most big herbivores and predators. The dire wolf is among these. Yep. Sabertooth cats go away. Yeah. Mammoths. But Canis lupus, the gray wolf, survives this event. Yeah. And along with mountain lions. Along with mountain lions. <laughs> and is now the largest canid alive today. So that's the history of dogs. That brings us to the modern day. Yeah. Now, now dogs more or are less. pretty much dogs as we know them. Yes. The last thing, much like with the cats, is there's one last event, which is when dog met human. Yep. We have the domestic dog. Now, this event is highly studied. And in some ways, we un have a decent understanding, and others, very little. There's a lot of mystery around how, when, and where we domesticated dogs. The reason that this is so sought after to figure out is because dogs were the first domesticated animal. Yeah. By, like, a lot. Yeah, in, in episode 27, we talked about the burst of domestication is around 10, 12,000 years ago, mm -hmm. and dogs had already been domesticated for at least a few thousand years yes if not many thousands of years before that the current research and current understandings has the earliest dog domestication typically anywhere from fifteen thousand years ago to thirty thousand years ago with some research and findings pushing it back even farther mm -hmm. so the earliest the oldest suggested is forty thousand years ago so when it happened it's hard to say. Part of the reason it's so difficult to nail down this is because all the evidence shows that during the time of domestication, they were also still freely breeding with wild wolves. Yeah, similar to what we described for cats. Exactly. So there is no clear line between, oh, wolf, dog. But it does sync up with the rise of human civilization, which is really... Why it's also such an interest is because when we were finally able to domesticate dogs is likely when we first were able to start forming settlements to domesticate an animal, you know, where we settle down and we're controlling our environment. So this also will tell us about our own history and understand the order of events. Now, gray wolves today are our dog's closest cousin, but we did not domesticate the gray wolf. The gray wolves and domesticated dogs diverged from an extinct wolf species, which is the one believed to be domesticated, to have been domesticated. So for all the documentaries out there that show you the clip of the wolf next to the dog, and that's not 100% accurate. <laughs> the Today's wolves are actually not super close cousins of the wolves that were domesticated. Now, where were dogs domesticated? That we also don't know. Archaeological findings and genetic research has suggested anywhere from Mongolia to Europe. So somewhere in Eurasia, but we don't have a really good answer. There's also been debate as to whether there was a single domestication event or multiple. Most studies suggest that there's been, there was a single domestication event. For instance, one study, two German dog skulls from 7,000 and 4,700 years old, uh, years ago, and tracing their genetic mutation rates suggested this was the one that suggested that dogs may have been domesticated as early as 40,000 but definitely by 20,000 so they even pushed the 15 back a little bit mm -hmm. and this these skulls supported that there was one domestication that then spread domestic dogs around the world but at least one other study has suggested two events a study that looked at the mitochondrial dna 
of 59 European dogs aged between 14,000 and 3,000 years old and the full genome of a 4,800-year-old dog from Ireland, comparing those with today's uh, wolves and modern dog breeds, suggested that dogs were domesticated in Asia by at least 14,000 years ago. But there are dog fossils that are apparently older than that from Europe, which led them to theorize that wolves were separately domesticated in Asia and Europe, but that the European branch led nowhere, that it did not contribute to our domestic dogs of today and petered out. And the fact that there are older fossils than the minimum date given for both areas have been found and a lack of dog fossils between those two points is some support that both of these places were domesticating dogs, if not at the same time, separately. Which leads us to the final big mystery of how. How did we domesticate dogs? Uh, the a classic hypothesis was that early settling humans kidnapped, uh, puppy napped, wolf pups and tamed them and then domesticated them, which is not generally agreed upon and supported, but that was one of the earlier suggestions. Huh. Uh, most people who have worked with, with wolves just say, no, that wouldn't work. <laughs> Why would you do that? That's not, mm -mm. Uh, Why would you intentionally take one of those? Well, and it's, and that's the other point they make is that during that time, we would have been in direct competition with this other dominant predator. Right. Why would we go steal their babies and then also likely not be able to tame them? Right. Well, that makes, and that makes domestication an intentional event, mm -hmm. which it likely wasn't at first. And that is the more prominent hypothesis these days, theory these days, is much like cats, that dogs domesticated themselves effectively through a, a style sometimes called survival of the friendliest. <laughs> this suggests that among wolves, individuals that were either less fearful of humans or generally friendlier to humans would be able to start approaching human settlements and taking advantage of the food found there, our scraps, our leavings, you know, like the trash and garbage mm -hmm. that might be left around human settlements. And that by being less threatening, by being more friendly, perhaps even just being friendlier might have gotten them to be fed, mm -hmm. they would gain an advantage over the less friendly wolves. And this would put a selective pressure on being a friendly wolf. Right. Like with cats, if you are... Friendly is a is a specific term. But yes. If you are generally less territorial, if you're generally less aggressive actively towards the people nearby, you get to stick around and eat food. Absolutely. And you're exploiting a food source that the other wolves out there aren't going to be able to do. Yeah. And it also may be easier for you to get to by adopting this strategy than having to put yourself in danger while hunting. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not getting like just tons more food or, you know, supremely better food, if you're getting it safely, that's huge. Now, friendliness was the term that was often used to describe it. And this is actually due to an experiment that has been run in Russia for around the last 40 years, the Fox farm experiment we mentioned that in episode 27 as well. We did. Famous domestication experiment. This is an experiment where some Russian scientists took foxes and bred them, but only bred based on friendliness. They would approach the foxes during set times, and those that were less aggressive to being approached, that seemed that showed more interest in the human. And especially if they showed active friendliness, active, you know... Coming up, saying hi. Yeah, positive yeah. behavior toward the human. Those would be bred while the less friendly would not be. They also did a parallel... With, with aggressive With foxes. aggressive foxes to see what would happen. Like, could you breed friendliness and aggression into uh, successive generations? And they wanted to see if it was purely breeding... Mm -hmm. and not taming. So they had very little interaction with the foxes between those moments of testing, of just observing it during a feeding. So they weren't hanging out, they weren't playing with, they weren't training the foxes. And what they found is that within a few generations, the foxes were showing much more social behavior toward humans, but also showed physical changes. Mm -hmm. Physical changes we associate to the domesticated dog. Some of them got floppy ears, 
Some of them started wagging their tails when they were excited. Less fear toward new people and more openness or more openness or curiosity toward investigating new things. Many of their tails started to curve. Some of them got splotched or spotted coats. Uh, and there was even changes in their jaws and teeth. All very similar to things that are common in the domestic dog today. And this trend, this you know, uh, turn of events, was dubbed domestication syndrome. With, with the humans only breeding for friendliness, the friendly ones being the ones to succeed, all these other changes came along with it. Now, this experiment has been criticized by other researchers because some of the foxes came from fox farms and photographs from a good 20 years before the experiment started in those farms showed what seemed to be very friendly foxes with splotched coats. Uh, so they may have been a little bit pre-domesticated. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that what the experiment found is wholly wrong, but the timetable. This it may might not, not be, be that quick. Yes. It may not be something that happens so quickly. And it may not happen from square one entirely. You know, there might have been some help. Uh, so there's there's a little bit of debate. The people of the Fox Farm experiment stood by their findings and said they were aware of what, they, you know, th those issues and made efforts to make sure it wasn't affecting. So some debate, but domestication has happened in more than one canid. And the most popular hypothesis today is that dogs effectively domesticated themselves while approaching human settlements and being non-threatening or even endearing. And since that time, a minimum of 14 to 15,000 years ago, mm -hmm. our two species have co-evolved to a very unique relationship. There are many domesticated species out there. Uh, dogs are so closely tied to humans, it's pretty insane. And today's domestic dog is not a wild dog anymore in so many ways that fundamentally they don't behave like wild dogs. Research has found that they don't cooperate with other dogs as well as they do with humans mm -hmm. in problem solving situations. While two wolves were given a problem and able to solve it, two dogs took turns politely waiting for one another is how they were described, but never thought to work together to solve the problem. And typically when dogs face a problem, they look to the nearest human. Yeah, we, we have created a group of animals that is extremely scarily dependent on us. Well, and not just that, but they it's also has become their success strategy is a dog will look to a human for help while a wolf won't look for help. Right. And so a dog might solve a problem a wolf won't because they decide to ask. Yep. So... It's also very successful for their part. There's also the fact that our brains are in sync. <laughs> Humans and dogs, when they gaze at each other, that's the wording from the experiment, <laughs> both of our brains release oxytocin, which is a chemical in the brain that's often associated with uh, pleasure, but is also the same chemical that's released during tight human bonding like mother and child. And so when you and your dog look at each other, your brains are responding the same way as a parent and child family gazing at one another. We have evolved this extremely close social relationship, not just learned to do it, mm -hmm. but evolved a physiological response yes. to it. And that is something that kind of uh, uh, bonding relationship is not seen in any two separate species other than humans and dogs. Yep. That's only us. And research into the genetics of dogs may have given an answer for why the friendliest were the ones to survive, to domesticate themselves initially. Potentially. This is, this is more of a suggestion than hard data. But in domestic dogs, there is a region of DNA that shows disruption. And in... Wolves, more aloof wolves, as they describe them, this DNA remains intact. And in us humans, that same stretch of DNA, when it sees disruption, sees, you know, uh, anomalies, is the cause for the Williams-Burin syndrome, which is in those who have this syndrome, often show overly friendly and outgoing personalities. 
that people with this this change in the genes tend to be very, very social, very friendly, very outgoing, very open towards strangers. And a similar behavioral shift is seen in mice with this genetic change. So if the earliest dogs happen to be the ones with this genetic feature, it may have been that they were genetically predisposed to a more friendly, open social nature, allowing them to approach humans and domesticate themselves over time. And that brings us to today with the wild dogs we have and the pets that share our homes. And a world covered in dogs. Covered in dogs. Well, arguably one of the most successful species on the planet because just everywhere. Yep. I saw one time a post of someone saying, like, a, it was a picture of a very sweet dog. And then the quote just said, what did we ever do to deserve dogs? And my original response back then was years and years of selective breeding and uh, hard work. But the truth is more accurate. What did we do to deserve dogs? They wanted to live with us because <laughs> we had food. And we've been together ever since. Yep. And then years and years of selective breeding yes. to do exactly what we want them to do. Exactly. So the relationship between human and dogs is truly unique. Nothing else quite matches it when you're comparing two species. And it we're still learning about the depths to which that connection has affected both of our behaviors. Before we wrap up the episode, we do have a patron question. That's true. So patrons of a certain level not only get their names shouted out, but also can ask us questions that we will answer on the podcast. And today's question is from Sam. It is. Sam asks, very simply and straightforward, favorite fossil sea urchin? <laughs> Good question. And if I'm honest, before you asked, I didn't have one. Nope. Same. Uh, I don't know anything about fossil sea urchins. I didn't know enough. And I had to look it up. And I found a group that is now my favorite, that I find fascinating, which is the Sideroida urchins, which were from the Jurassic and Cretaceous. So sea urchins, for anyone who's unfamiliar, are echinoderms. They're cousins of sea stars. They're actually basically a sea star that's rolled up all the arms into a ball. And all of those spines that they're covered with, they're the pincushion things crawling around the seafloor. Those are similar structures to the tube feet, and they actually still have those tube feet covering their body that you find on the underside of a sea star. Nah. So it's just a sea star that you've rolled up into a ball. <laughs> into a little a little spiky Roomba. Yes. They're mainly herbivorous, and those spines they use to walk around, but also for defense. And when we find fossil sea urchins, you either find the cast, which is the main core body, but usually not with spines on it because they have these little joints and just pop yeah, right off. Break off. They shed them regularly. Living sea urchins just leave them all over and grow new ones. And then you'll find isolated spines. You can often identify species by certain spines. And this group is famous for having club-shaped spines. Most urchins have these like long kind of needle-ish you know, or you know, stick like you know, yeah, they may not be sharp, but they're pointy or pokey. Yeah, they're they're just a, a tapering cylinder with either a sharp or blunt tip, but yeah, you know, just a little spine, a little spike. These are like paddles and like acorn shaped and like pine cone shaped, and one of them looks like a corn, a, a ear of corn, and they're weird and knobby, and I love it. I want to see these things alive and walking around so bad. <laughs> yeah, you showed me some pictures of them, and they are just fantastic. So the Sideroidea. Sideroidea. We, that's a weird... It, it, it's always interesting to learn about a group of animals that is weird today. Yes. Because sea urchins, that's a weird shape. Oh, yes. To be. You're a, a little spiky koosh ball. You're covered in eyes and feet and spines. Literally. And you have ancient cousins who are weird for urchins. Yes. Like hell ants. <laughs> weird cousins of animals that are already weird. <laughs> so there you go, Sam. Good question. We had to learn a thing. I now have a favorite fossil urchin, so thank you. How about that? <laughs> and with that, we are going to wrap up our episode. Hopefully everyone enjoyed this double feature. Yes. Cats and dogs. I know I did. I learned tons from both. Same. It's for what for groups that we are so familiar with, 
there's so much more that there was to learn, but also that we are have yet to learn. We're still learning about these animals that are, are so near and dear to us, which I, I think is pretty cool. Yeah, it is. There's mysteries to our best friends. And if you want to hear any more about any of the things we mentioned, let us know. You'll notice I did not go into dog breeds nope. because that is entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> there will, as always, be links and photos in the blog. So if you want to read more, learn more on your own, you can go there. And if you have any questions or suggestions, contact us in the usual ways. Social media, email, all of that. Keep an ear out for our Dragon Con stuff coming up soon. Also, go check out the Ask a Scientist podcast that we were on. We release episodes every fortnight. So... We'll see you then. Next episode's one of those five episodes. It is, so you know what that means. Special, special event. This one's going to be super special. I'm excited for this Ooh, one. Ooh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. You'll all be excited for it, too, when we tell you what it is. Just you wait. Two weeks. Until then, bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.